All right, folks, welcome back to the Property Couch podcast. And today's episode is all about a man who used a heart attack as a reason to trigger a property portfolio event. But it gets even better, Bryce. We're also talking about someone who has started building their property portfolio in their 50s. It's never too late to get started. It's a great episode, folks. Let's rip into the show. Welcome to The Property Couch, where each week you get to listen to two of Australia's leading experts. Bryce Holdaway, co-host of Location, Location, Location Australia on Foxtel's Lifestyle Channel, co-host of Escape from the City on the ABC and partner of Empower Wealth Advisory. Ben Kingsley, Chair of Property Investors Council of Australia and the founder of Empower Wealth Advisory, named the 2018 and 2019 Property Advisory Firm of the Year. Stay tuned as they bring you the insider's guide to property, finance, and money management. All right, Ben, we've got a very special guest today. We are chatting with TPC listener, Tom Decker. Welcome to the Property Couch, Tom. Hey guys, how you doing? We're doing pretty good, thanks. We're looking forward to chatting with you. You've got, uh, you've got a wonderful portfolio that we get to unpack with you shortly, but uh, we're going to start it off where we always started off, Tom, and go back to the very beginning sure. around money conversations you may or may not have had around the dinner table when you were growing up. Yep. Well, you know, look, from my point of view, money wasn't really a discussion point. My uh, parents were quite conservative, so money didn't really enter uh, the conversation no idea what dad earned. Mum was a stay-at-home mum, looked after the kids. Um, but the one thing I did get from growing up, my father <clears throat> um, encouraged us to work with him around the house to earn some pocket money. And that inspired me to start working around the neighbourhood, mowing lawns, resurfacing people, uh, well, one in particular resurfacing a floor and uh, doing Estopol, as it was called then, and earning money, saving it, you know, that sort of put me in the right direction, I guess, to learn to save, work hard, that type of thing. But in terms of uh, talk around the table, didn't happen. We should build some context here for those just listening. You're uh, in this wonderful part of the world in New South Wales. It's full of trees, which we can see, but lots of dogs and Indeed. everything in the background. You're at the back, which is good. So we get to experience I the, am. I the, am nature, yes. the nature as well to explain why you can hear dogs barking. But um, so, so your parents were conservative and yes. uh, they got you understanding jobs and working hard. So what, what were the observations then that you were making? around money that you got from your parents if they, if you weren't having direct conversations? Well, the, the, I guess, put simply, the observation I had was if you want it, you've got to work for it. Pretty simple. Pretty now, simple. Tom, did, 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 was that similar to the way in which your dad approached life? Was he a hard worker? Did he... Um, um... Yeah, I, I think he was. Um, you know, my father wasn't the greatest of communicators, so he wasn't an open book, yeah. so to speak. My mother was, but my father was sort of fairly closed door. But he and certainly who, worked hard. We, we saw that. He'd leave early in the morning, come home late in the evening. And who did the home economics? Uh, Dad. Dad. So he managed yeah. the he managed the finances as well as working yeah. full-time? Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. And household composition as you were growing up, sort of number of brothers, sisters? Yeah, I've got uh, three siblings, an elder brother, and then a younger sister and a younger brother. And so without giving too much away, I always like to sort of pry a little bit here around um, your behaviour. You've obviously been very successful. We're going to unpack that story shortly. Sure. But have Did your other siblings also develop um, some of those habits as well in terms of, you know, working hard, money management, delayed gratification? Not really, No. Um, I, I'm sort of the odd one out in okay. that respect. Um, one of my brothers done quite well. He's a, um, a professor. You know, he, uh, he works hard. He's worked in the same place for a long time, yep. from day one pretty much. Um, but, yeah, I'm, I guess, the only one that sort of had that focus on investment property and that type of thing. Where did, where did that spark come from? Why, why, why are you the pioneer there? It, yeah, it, it's interesting, Bryce, because um, 30-something years ago when I was in my mid-20s, 
I bought my first house with my um, my then wife, and probably three or four years after we bought that house, after begging the bank to lend us some money, we bought an investment property, and uh, that investment property was two minutes walk from where we lived. We kept that for five or six years. I did it up a little and then sold it. Um, so that was sort of my first entry into it. And then I I sort of forgot about it, just didn't do anything for another 20-odd years. And it was only five or six years ago I had a life-changing moment, had a heart attack, um, and was just sort of a, a wake-up call, um, started the journey again, bought an investment property on the Central Coast. Um, at that point, I was actually renting, so I'd uh, been divorced and uh, just renting, treading water, living the life, nice cars, all that type of thing. Had the wake-up call, reality check, bought an investment property up on the Central Coast. A year later, bought a primary residence, again, on the Central Coast. Um, and about a year, 18 months after that, my partner was diagnosed with Parkinson's. So travelling from the Central Coast down to Sydney for work was a bit too much. And we bought here on the North Shore. Now, there's a fair bit in that. We've there's had there's a lot in that. <laughs> yeah, there's a, so, so, so first of all, what struck me in what you just said, Tom, was you have a heart attack and then you start thinking long term. Yeah. <laughs> like that is so inconsistent with a lot of people who experience a significant health trauma and then think I've got to make every day count. Yeah. You actually start planning for your future. So can you unpack for me that story around what triggered you to think, well, okay, now I've got to get serious about my life or what, what was it that sort of yeah, drove into that story? It's interesting, Ben, because you can look at it two ways. You can either count your days and think it's all over short yeah. term, in which case I would have continued to live the life. But I, I thought, you know, I'm, I'm in a relationship, I've got a serious partner, I've got a good career, time to think positively you know, start exercising, looking after myself. And according to my cardiologist, you know, it was a setback. I had a um, triple bypass. Okay. Um, but outside of all of that um, and that scary moment, he assures me everything is okay. I'm not that old, you know. I didn't catch the timing on that. Did you say that happened five years ago? Uh, five, six years ago, yeah. Yeah, okay. All right. Yeah. So for context, um, you're now 59. Correct. Um, for our audio listeners, and you've got a, a beautiful wife, Crystal, who's currently yep. 60. Yep. Yep. Okay. And Correct. In, in so Crystal was your partner at the time, which was she the one yes. who? So she's yes. the one who's diagnosed with Parkinson. Correct. Yes. Okay. And so um, she she watches you have a, a medical episode. Um, and she's also got her own challenges medically as well. And you both decide to go and build a property, a multi-million dollar property portfolio. <laughs> sort of, yeah. I mean, I had the heart attack before she was diagnosed. Okay. And it's, yep. it's quite a uh, story behind the heart attack because I actually went in for a general procedure, uh, what they call an angiogram. So they just yep. go and have a look. Um, and... The cardiologist told me I needed to have bypass surgery. He couldn't put a stent in. Oh. And whilst I'm debating with the cardiologist, in fact, the thoracic surgeon, that I'll go home and I'll come back three days later for the surgery, whilst I'm having that debate, I had the heart attack. Wow. How fortunate. And within minutes, she was scrubbing up and getting ready to operate. Wow. Um, Saved your life. It did, and it, it taught me that, you know, some things happen for a reason. I was in that hospital, and one of the best hospitals in Sydney, um, having a simple procedure when my heart gave out, and it just sent that message to me that, you know, there are, there are guardian angels. She was 
obviously one of them, the thoracic surgeon. And it was a, you know, a real wake up call, obviously. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Now, can I, can I then touch on that, right? You've had this yes. moment. Um, this is obviously pre crystals diagnosis. Yes. And so are you thinking all of a sudden what happened if something happens to me, because you're right, you've got a good career, high, you know, moderate to high income, I think you were saying. So you've got a, a good, good financial. But if you're gone, the major breadwinner in the household is then no longer. How does Crystal then survive? Was that part of that trigger to it, sort of... It was certainly part of it, absolutely. But yeah. it might sound wrong, but I was focused on us being together, not us being apart. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. But it was certainly something in the back of my mind. Yep. So, Tom, okay, so there's there's a couple of things I want to lean in. Um, first of all, you forgot about an investment property. We, we, we absolutely need to unpack so that everyone knows how to forget about an investment property. <laughs> no, I, di I didn't actually. It took 20 years. No, it's, a, it's not quite like that. Sorry, I should backtrack a little. So I bought this investment property, um, as I said, 20-odd years ago. And we sold it after five or six years. I did a, a minor renovation, yeah. sold it, used that um, that that capital growth and upgraded our PPR at the time. Yep. And then just wasn't focused, you know, was busy with career and travel and all those sorts of different things. Forgot about property investment and what it could possibly oh, bring. Yeah, gotcha. All right. Yeah. Okay. So, so just, why property? Why property? Just easy to understand for me. Yeah. Yeah. Just I, I tend to think I get it. Who were the That's influencers simple. then back then? Mid twenties. You said I, I, I think I picked you up by yes. saying it was thirty years ago. Um, yep. Who like? There's no podcast. There's no seminars. Like there's no webinars. No, it, who are the influencers? Just reading. You know, there was nothing in particular, just something that seemed like a good idea. But you picked, I mean, you had that 20-year hiatus and then you picked it up again, right? So you had this little yeah, correct. renovate uh, flip flipper for yeah. five years and now you're back into it. So when you did said, okay, why property? Because you think you can understand it. At, you yep. know, we're, we're talking only, what, six, seven years ago now where you've accumulated this portfolio in your 50s. Let's not forget yes. that. So yep. you started post 50 um you probably started around my age now um and here we are with a again a, a a number of properties six properties in the portfolio so to, to bryce's point what were the what were the sort of um go-to educational um you know aspects of building out that knowledge to act so aggressively mm -hmm. over the course of the last few years well a lot of it has been listening to guys like yourself yep Right, and as I said, I, I've you know I'm a bit of a content freak, so I absorb as much information as I can from as many people as possible. Um, but you know that property that we had, um, it'd be almost thirty years ago now. The reason <clears throat> I sort of reflect back on it, we bought that place for, I think it was two hundred and twelve thousand dollars in a suburb called Ride in Sydney. We <laughs> I sold know where this five, is going. We oh. sold it five years later for 550 And three or four years ago, it sold for $1.7 million. <laughs> <laughs> so is that we, we, need, we need to pause here, Ben. We need to pause here because we're talking about a three-decade experience yeah. here. Yes. We've gone from 212,000 to 1.7 million. And one of the things that Ben and I have been trying to do on this podcast, Tom, and you've just illustrated it beautifully, is saying if you can hold it for 30 years, the majority of the actual dollar value growth will happen in the third decade. Yes. Uh, and what you've just illustrated then is beautifully that if um, wonderful hindsight, we all hold these properties, we never sell them. But mm. if you had of, the experience that you would have had is in the third decade, you would have had this wonderful Correct. amount of dollar value bank that you would have been able to do just because you played a decades game rather than a year's game. And I guess yep. uh, the reason I want to labor on this point is because that is the very thing that Ben and I are trying to get everyone in our community to understand. 
yeah, look, in hindsight, I would have held it for that entire period, but I didn't. I sold it. I thought it was great back then, you know, to go from 200 odd thousand to 550. Um, and we spent a little on it, not a lot, maybe 30 grand or something. So it was really good capital growth. In the perfect world, yes, I'd still have it today and that would be wonderful. But now we sort of zoom forward 25 odd years later and I start getting back into property. But that was sort of the background and it gave me reason to trust property again. Tom, can I just jump in there? I know sure. I know you're in flow there, but I because to Bryce's point about that game, right now where we are in the property cycle and we are seeing a spike in the number of investors selling properties at the moment. Mm -hmm. And so I just wanted to sorry to jump in there, but you know, for the last sort of month and a half, we've been really stressing do whatever you can to hold on to your property. Yeah. Do whatever you can to hold on to your property. Take a second job. Do whatever you can for this hump because this I hump can't. might only last for the next six months. And then if, you, if you're absolutely forced to sell, you're going to be selling in a seller's market rather than a buyer's market, right? We're at this lull period here right now. So those people who are you know, listing their properties because they're tapping out, Please try whatever you can. So I just because you just heard if we if you know benefit of hindsight, we don't want to go back here twenty years from now and say to those people, we told you to just do whatever yeah. you can. Like find a way. Um, if you got loved ones, family, friends, borrow five grand, whatever you can, just to trade through this period because it will return in spades that opportunity. So I'm terribly sorry to interrupt what you were just saying because I want to now pick up on what you were just talking about, but. If that message lands for, for the majority of our community, we've just made them hundreds of thousands of dollars um, in the future. So so now yeah. pick up the story from, okay, you're now back into thinking about property in your 50s. Yeah, so look, I reflected back on that particular property and what we achieved with that property. So for that reason, it was, it, it felt safe. Mm. So... We bought the first property up on the Central Coast. Um, that was probably, this is going to sound a bit bizarre, but it was probably four months after the heart attack. I bought wow. the first property up on the Central Coast and about a year later bought um, a, a PPR. And at the time, um, I remember actually I had a fixed rate at 4% or something. It might have been a little bit higher. And I actually uh, paid the bank a penalty to drop the rate down, right? Because we saw where it was going. The rates yeah, just right. kept declining. So we bought that property. Crystal was diagnosed. So we then sold that one and moved down to Sydney. Um, but it was as we moved to Sydney, which was in June, July of 2020. So just as the pandemic had started. Um, I knew I had to do something. Superannuation wasn't where it was. I was listening to you guys. And I started talking to various um, uh, property buyers. And I had several conversations. Ended up with this one guy that we, we just connected. You know, had a number of meetings with him, face-to-face um, -face as well as virtual and uh, next thing you know, we start the property journey. So in 2021, we bought three, um, one in Adelaide, two in regional New South Wales. Then early, I might have the time, yes, early 22, we bought another one uh, in uh, Queensland. And then in February this year, bought another one in Perth. So I think that's right. That's five, six in total, mm -hmm. including the one on the Central Coast. Yep. So it's happened fairly quickly. Um, fortunately, the timing seems to be right. You know, we, we seem to have gotten the timing right. The, uh, the yields are pretty good. The growth on all of those properties has been 
fantastic. Yeah, to say the least. You know, yeah, it's it's been fantastic, and and even um, with all the media talk about the downturn and everything, I saw it stabilize, but nothing much beyond that really. Um, and and you know, it's a uh, it's an interesting market when agents are calling you asking you if you want to sell your property. Yes, you know. Can we build some context around the value too, Tom? You've you've, you've shared with us. Can yes. we build some context around value here? Sure. You, you, just for the investment properties, you've shared with us the value and the debt. Are you okay with me disclosing that? Um, yeah. Yep. So, um, you sure? Yeah. 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 So five point five four million with a debt of two point one six million. Um, yep. So your net position is three. Go oh, my maths. Three point three. Yes. Nine? 3.39? Um, that that seems pretty good. It's so very good. Starting very in, good. in 2020. Oh, you started Central Coast earlier, but you started yes. the, um, the rapid um, development in 2020. That's... Um, yeah. That, that's... Well, the, the, the property on the Central Coast was 2017. Mm-hmm. So February 2017. Um, that's grown quite well. That's had stagnant for quite some time. I, well, I bought in 2017. You guys know what the market was like then. I I bought probably at the top end of the market. Um, so it was slow for a few years, but that's now had some rapid growth. That's done very well. Um, the property where, where we live, our PPR, has also performed quite well. And that, that would be the bulk of the equity, I guess, you know, in the, in the total portfolio. The balance... Um, Depending, one is held in superannuation, so that's got a very low LVR, um, and the balance, I would say, the LVR on those alone would be 70 75 percent. Now, Tom, the, the Central Coast property in yes. 2017, um. You, you tell the story early on that the property you very first purchased for investment was in the same suburb, and that's very common in yep. terms of, you know, five minutes away, two minutes drive, two kilometres up the road or whatever that looks like, and that's the ride property. Um, do you think if you had your time over again, if someone told you to be a boardless investor straight away and buy interstate, that you would, I have, been would have confident enough? I No, I didn't hesitate. So my buyer's agent, when he started talking to me about buying interstate, it was a Easy for me. Adelaide was actually the first one we bought. Did you think that that was the case because you'd tested the water and that you sort of had some familiarity in terms of buying locally versus buying? Yeah. It's po- hard to possi- say, right? It's, yeah, it's hard to respond. Yeah, respect possibly. I, I spent a lot of time listening to podcasts like yours yeah, okay. before I engaged a buyer's agent. Yep. And it became very clear that buying close by or in the same state didn't really make a lot of sense well, or it wasn't necessary. Isn't there? Yeah, there's diversity in spreading that risk, yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, the, the house in Adelaide I've never seen, the one in Queensland never seen, Perth never seen. Um, the ones in regional New South Wales, though, I have seen. Um, I've been to both of them. I'm a fairly hands-on sort of guy, so it was a security thing initially. The house up on the central coast, it's easy for me to get in the car, drive up, have a look, you know. Um, But now I'm relaxed. You know, probably the best performing properties are the ones outside of New South Wales. (laughs) Can we get a, can we fill in your backstory too around what sort of line of work you do? You said you're hands on sort of guy. Is that the sort of work that you're doing? No, I'm, well, yes, I, I am hands on in my profession as well. I work in the video game space. Ah. I've been doing that for the last 32, 33 years. What does that mean? You're, build, you're building games? No, no. I um, I actually d- distribute the product. Gotcha. Oh, gotcha. So sales, marketing, that type of thing. Gotcha. Wonderful. Now, now, Tom, one of the biggest barriers for, for investors coming in, because yours is a success story, you know, uh, 2x, 3x, you've done really, really well. And a lot of older investors, you know, there's a lot of people in their early 40s who are thinking, 
Is it too late? Have I missed the boat? And here you are really getting serious about your portfolio in your early 50s. Um, the common concerns that most people have around properties is um, what are the tenants going to be like? And, mm -hmm. and so can you just share a, some experiences around maintenance, upkeep and how your tenants are looking after <laughs> your properties and if you've had any yeah. challenges in that area? Yeah, I've certainly had some challenges. I've had some uh, some horror ten tenants. I shouldn't say horror, just challenging. Difficult, yes. Yeah, difficult. Um, some are over-demanding. And the biggest mistake I made is I got personally involved. I didn't leave it to the agents the way I should have. Um, How did that play out? What did that mean? Well, you know, I, I'd have a... A complaint from a tenant so I'd actually so we're referring to the home on the central coast I would actually go up and attend to the matter get involved you know and I, I've learned it's not the thing to do you know if you can avoid it leave it to the agent the agents are uh, a lot more let's say direct in managing the tenants probably more experienced with knowing what is just a demand for the sake of a demand versus an actual required repair. Yeah, there's a there's a removal of emotion. There's a professionalism that comes Correct. from it. There's a um, not first rodeo um, about it as well. So yeah, you know, but now I, I focus on managing the agents rather than managing the property directly. But I, I did have one other issue. Uh, one of the properties I bought in regional New South Wales had it's the gift that keeps giving. Anything that could go wrong went wrong. To tell? Anything. You know, <laughs> it was just nonstop cracks appearing in the walls. So we ter it turned out there were foundation issues, had to get the foundations redone. Kitchen started falling apart. The oven stopped working. The heater stopped working. You name it, whatever mm -hmm. could go wrong went wrong. And this particular property is a bit of a, um, a land bank, if you like. It's on a 1,000 square metres. So the retirement plan was to either put a granny flat in and increase the rental return or subdivide um, but it, it's just been non-stop so I decided after just doing lots of band-aid type of work you know little fix here a little fix there vacated the property for three months and did everything in one shot had the foundations redone, the kitchen redone, the bathroom redone, everything painted throughout. Now I've got some wonderful tenants in there, hopefully long term, and I've not had a problem, touch wood, for about three months. How did you navigate that mentally? Like, because there's people listening to this who, um, what you just described is the very is the very fear that they have that 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 lifts their action threshold yeah. up. So they don't want to take um, any any steps forward. How how did you navigate that? What what would be your advice? What's the wisdom that you took out of it? Um, yeah, it's, <coughs> it's it's interesting, Bryce, because at first I got emotionally involved, got stressed, and it just got to a point where I thought, "Hang on, I'm going to have another heart attack." Yeah. <laughs> um, but the the truth of the matter is, I looked at the the growth, I, I got fed up with it and I actually had an agent go in and appraise the house to sell. Yep. And as I said, Very it's on common. a thousand square meters. The assessment he gave me with the house the way it was, I would have been a hundred grand up. Yep. Given that I was a hundred grand up if I sold it the way it was, I decided long term, fix it. Give it another five, ten years, it'll be another hundred grand or whatever the, the amount is. Yeah. So I saw the potential in it. Yeah. And whilst it was a, a bit of a, a shame that you know we'd bought this house and it had all these issues that weren't picked up um, as they should have been, um, I decided it was time to just bite the bullet. I bought it at a good price as it was, so it was time to just realise. Well, you bought it cheap if that's the right word invest a little more and make it the property it should be and that's mm. what i did 
So th- those without a vision uh, will perish. So what was your vision in all of this? What What was the North Star? What were you... Simple. Accum- accumulation in itself. But what, what were you aiming for? Well, as I said, um, this property is a bit of a land bank. So whether it's a granny flat or a subdivide, probably granny flat, to be honest. Um, I just saw the long term. Though, what about the portfolio? Because to navigate everything that you're mm-hmm. navigating there, in the moment, that's stressful and anxiety-filled. But you must have been able to zoom out and see the vision that you had for the portfolio. What what was what was the drive? Was there a, was it a number of properties you were chasing? Was it a passive income goal oh. you were chasing? Was it a... What, what, what was the fruit at the end for you? In terms of the total portfolio and of yeah. this particular property? Yeah, just to it, keep it going on that land bank. Yeah, well, th- there's a few things. So I have three grandchildren and Crystal has four. So we've got yeah. seven between us. Um, so it, it's sort of twofold. One is self-funded retirement, passive income. Yep. So that we can actually enjoy retirement. And the other is to be able to pass on uh, a legacy to our grandchildren and children. Now, that particular property that we're talking about was a critical part of the the mix. Well, at least that was the plan, you know, have a house and a granny flat or subdivide and lift the rental return on that particular investment. And that's why I didn't want to give up now, Tom, as you've built a relationship with your buyer's agent and you've sort of executed on uh, property by property plan, mm-hmm. what was the conversations around location, price points um, that, that's got you to where you needed to get to? Because with your age, definitely yield would have played a role because ultimately, you know, if you're looking at a retirement time frame of 65 yep. or, or, or around that sort of area, you need these properties to, to do some of that sort of heavy lifting and cash flow lifting earlier. Is that sort of why you've lent into, say, some of the more regional areas or those types of areas where uh, yields are quite high? Was that part of the strategy that was developed De- between you and... Yeah, definitely Ohio? part of it, Ben. Um, yep. and, and still undecided what that portfolio mix looks like when we do retire. And as part of what I reached out to you guys about yes, was... Yes, we've got that. It's, well, I'm gonna, we're going to have that Yeah, yeah, I know we'll get to that. So <laughs> it's, you know, what that mix looks like in five and a bit years' time, I'm not entirely sure, but you're right. <clears throat> the, the yield was critical, I mean, just from a, a cash flow and, and to be able to build quickly, hmm. I needed them to be cash flow positive or yeah. some of them. Yep. And so that's some of the trade-offs you get. You're going into areas which um, are price point lower, but also some of the areas where the demographics of the tenancy profile is also a little bit lower. Um, And they they are the trade-offs. So anyone who's thinking of these types of strategies, you've just got to be clear that you might, you know, bump into a difficult tenant who's not respectful of your property. And these are the, you know, again, these are the, the headaches you're going to get. But if you then lift your eyes up, get into that higher grade of thinking and you can see that the juice is worth the long-term squeeze, then you know ultimately that's when you start to, to your point on the example that you use with the land bank property, it's like, wait a minute. I mean, yeah, I'm getting some early headaches, so I'm going to clear some of those headaches away. But now I've, got, I've, got, I've improved the asset, which I'm allowed to depreciate those renovations. 30 grand you might have spent. I've now got a better tenant in the property potentially because it's newer and more modern. So it's attracted a better tenant. And so it's now starting to be a set and forget asset, um, which is part of the portfolio. Yep. No, 100%. 100%. But it's, it's interesting that those regional properties, I've actually not had problems with the tenants. I've had problems with the house. <laughs> yes, but good point. Good point. Hey, yes. happens. So you, 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 one of the questions you asked for us um, uh, as you were preparing to come on to the show, uh, Tom, was, you know, you believe you're in a good position, but um, you're mm-hmm. curious as to whether you purchase again or focus on consolidating debt given your age. Um, we're, we're happy to give some feedback on that. But what does what your instinct say to that question? My instinct is to consolidate. And, wow. uh, you know, I've got all, all the loans run P&I. Um, I've still got two on fixed, about to roll off. 
Um, but my instinct is to pay down the debt as quickly as possible, consolidate, have a look what it looks like when I do decide to retire, maybe sell one, pay everything off and live off the rent. That's my instinct. So what's the payoff for you to then consider buying another one? What's what's the opportunity cost in your mind that you're that you're wrestling with? Well, I, you know, I, I look at the performance in the last, I'm going to say six years, but in particular the last three, it's, it's been fantastic, you know. And if, if I knew 150% that that was going to happen for the next 10 years <laughs> at the same rate. We'd all be cutting checks. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> so, you know, it's it's just one of those things. I'm at that point. I turned 60 this year. I'm at that point where retirement is a thing. You know, I, I, I get emails every other week from my superannuation fund inviting me to seminars about retirement and, you know, income streams and all that type of thing. So it's it's coming. Yeah. So I'm just undecided as to whether I consolidate, pay down, live off the the rent, you know, or whether I go again. Don't know. You know, but I said that I said that probably nine months ago and I bought one in February this year. <laughs> <laughs> well, we all know that obviously property doesn't move in that perfect perfect lineal direction, right? There it goes in cycles and we've yep. come off a pretty good cycle. And um, we know that what's stopping that cycle right now is these higher interest rates, um, which is reducing borrowing power, reducing activity. And we also know general market sentiment is in the negative space. So, you know, if, if I was your advisor, Tom, here's, here's some of the questions I'd be asking you. How much is enough in terms of for you to live out a comfortable retirement and to also then pass on that legacy to the seven grandchildren. Like, let's start thinking about what that legacy story looks like. Are we talking mm -hmm. about an amount of money that is um, uh, enough for an education? Is it amount of money for that's enough to get a deposit started for them to be able to get onto the property ladder? They are the types of questions that you and Crystal need to be thinking about because at the end of the day, as you've realised, you've got a wonderful portfolio, you've generated millions of dollars of paper profits, but now it comes down to, all right, well, what are we going to execute on what this story looks like? So when you get closer to knowing the answers to those questions, you then get more informed and the decision becomes easier in terms of what that story looks like. So, you know, the the risk you run of going again is that you have a, we have a 2017, 2018 moment where for 18 months, basically the property is treading water and given you're rolling off your fixed interest rates, if I was to see all your cash flow models, I'd then be seeing the impact of that and I'd be saying, even though it's negatively uh, positively geared now, we still run the risk of slight uh, negative and we've got, if we've got maintenance and holding costs that are also attached to that and we get any silly governments you know, trying to introduce higher land taxes and all, all of those things are a variable that, that may be out of our control. So your your uh, core instinct of basically saying, have we got enough? And seeing that model roll out over the next um, five to 10 years in terms of how that compounding story will happen, and then how the improvement of that cash flow story will happen in the acceleration of getting that debt down is also going to inform the story as to if we need to sell one, if we need to sell any, or if we want to accelerate that story where we can be more active in, in our younger retirement, as opposed to, you know, when we're 90, we're probably not yeah. going to be jumping out of planes, you know, that, that type of story. So it really is, you know, this is a bottle of red moment for you and Crystal to sit down and start to think about, you know, what are the, what does this money mean to you? And what is it going to, how is it going to enrich your life? And how is it going to enrich the life of those that it's going to serve? And yeah. as you get more clarity around that, guess what? The actual execution decision itself becomes easier. Um, and that that's consistently with how we would talk to any clients that we're working with. It really is about your individual story, what you are individually trying to achieve, and also acknowledging that the work that you have done, the heavy lifting that you have done over the last effectively nine or so years has 
yielded some incredible fruit. Um, that's through good timing, but also good location selection and good property selection through your advisor yeah. as well. So all of those are, uh, uh, you know, give you an A A A plus story. Now it's about landing the plane and how you do that. Yeah. No, I think you're right, Ben. And look for us. You know, you you asked the question, how much is enough? It's enough. Yeah. It's not a question of more. You know, it's not about that at all. You know, we're not looking for fancy cars and five star hotel holidays and all that type of thing. It's more around what we've got is that enough to be able to consolidate by selling a property or two. It's it's more around that. It's more the back end of it. Yeah. Um, I've done some modelling, and you know, if if we retain all the properties into retirement there's plenty of income stream. There's no issue with that. It's more around can we actually retire all that debt in five years? You know, that's a big ask. So <clears throat> then it comes down to which property do you sell? Do you invest a little more, grow a little more, and so on? Sorry. No, that's all right. So what I want to – so how we model that, so just so you know, and this is, again, for the community's benefit, we model on – We've always modeled on liquidity story, right? So we look at basically total access to liquidity, which is a combination of um, money and offsets. Um, it's a combination of access to super and what that story looks like. The trigger point for us in our models when we do these long-term models is when we get to a $100,000 cash base. So, mm -hmm. so when we're doing long-term projections, when we get to that $100,000, that's our trigger to do a hypothetical sale at that moment in time. Now, of course, when you get closer to that, and and in your case, what you're just saying is if if we're able to go for one or two more years and we don't have to sell any of those properties, well, you've already learned from your story early on with the first property you bought yep. not to sell it. So if you can land the plane, have the comfortable retirement, just means you've got more more spoils um, to be able to do that. So, so that might be also something that might inform your judgments around just how much liquidity you need. And of course, we also know people make silly mistakes in selling properties too quickly in the same um, tax year, so we'd make sure that you sell them. In if you if Spread anyone, them out. yeah, if anyone's in a situation, the way in which we would then model. So as we do a divestment model, if we need to, we do a divestment model where we obviously then work out the capital gains that we have to pay, and then that obviously then we get a lump sum of cash. That cash goes into our cash buckets. And then when that, that one gets down to $100,000, and that might be, you know, three to four years from that first one, and then all of a sudden, as you get closer to them, um, you can you, you can make a more informed decision. And so from, from where I sit over the course of the next couple of years, you can sit on your hands, let everything sort of continue to keep playing out like it is, and as you're getting closer to that around the amount of money that you want to spend, that'll inform your decision as to whether you need to trigger a sale. Yeah, yep, makes good sense. I think uh, the other benefit that uh, from this question is for the for the benefit of the community, Tom, is it's kind of a it's kind of a question around what game are you actually playing? Um, because in this conversation, there's a 48 year old, an almost 52 year old, and a 59 year old, and so with all different time horizons, we could all have different views that we could project onto this situation. And I'm more comfortable with debt than you, or Ben's more aggressive than me, or whatever. So that's why we're such advocates of actually. Um, of, of having a plan so you can actually work out some of these questions that you've got because it's kind of like if if it's kind of like after asking a power lifter advice on how to prepare for a marathon they're mm -hmm. playing two totally separate games and in maths two plus two equals four no matter what your age what no matter what your background is no matter what your demographic is no matter what your salary incentives are two plus two equals four but we, we apply the same logic when it comes to money and say well there's only one solution well it it does come down to a lot of those things that Ben just talked about. Your risk profile. Are you okay carrying a bit of debt in retirement if there's enough to provide you with an income that's satisfactory to what you require while still having surplus left over that will support the portfolio so that we can still have that ride story in 30 years' time that you haven't sold that would and be you're nice. still holding on? <laughs> and the, the, the rents, um, as long as it's not in Victoria, we're not allowed to put them up more than uh, once every two years. Don't but, start um, me, Bryce. 
you, you will get some rental growth in that portfolio that over time, the rent that you're receiving will make the interest that you're paying look like your kid's lunch money, right? So yeah. Yeah. so that's, that's, that's the important lesson here. We're all playing a different game. Your incentives are different to my incentives. What you consider fun may be different to what I consider fun. So therefore, it's having a base understanding around you and Crystal, how much is enough, how much do we need to give the kids, all the things that Ben just said, um, whilst being very mindful of the position you're in. There's, there's a bit going on. But I guess at a headline level, you're in a strong position. Yeah. What we haven't said, you, what you have, what we haven't said yet is in the notes that you gave us, you've got an 18-month buffer. So what that does is gives you 18 months of time that you can buy. I had this yeah. conversation with a mate at dinner last night who was a bit um, nervous about whether to keep his investment property. I'm like, mate, you just got to buy time. Well, with an 18-month buffer, you get to buy time. That's- yeah, look, exactly. But that uh, just to put some context around that, during the fixed rates, huh. I couldn't make extra payments. So I focused on putting it all into buffers. So Beautiful. one of the properties, we, we bought it uh, under a variable. So I just dumped everything I could into that. Perfect. Everything. Into the offset. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yep. So Everything possible. So it, it essentially, the way it worked, when the interest rates started going up, coincidentally, I um, calculated what my repayments would be on the entire portfolio at 6%. And I increased the payment on that one property with a variable loan to an equal amount of that 6% for the entire portfolio, less the payments I was making on the fixed, if that makes sense. So my yep. total fortnightly payments were equal to what it would be P&I 6%. And I was doing that for almost a year before they started coming off. And that's another perfect learning lesson for people who are planning to build out portfolios is that it, you cannot have all of your uh loans in fixed if you don't have offsets against them because there is going to be surplus coming into those yep. portfolios. So you want to model how much um, surplus you anticipate to get over the course of the next few years and then give yourself a 20% um, ceiling in terms of that number because, yeah, we've had situations when the rates collapse down to those cheaper, you know, 1.9 to 2.2% mm. interest rates. People were like, oh, I've run out of space in my offset account. And it's like, <laughs> and so, you know, they didn't My know where to problem. Yeah, it's a, again, it's a lovely problem to have, um, you know, so, but it, but it also just goes to show that plan to become what you plan to become and, and do the modeling right. And then ultimately your money's working as yeah. optimized as it should be because you've done the sequencing, you've done, you've done the number crunching. And so to your point, Tom, you haven't made any of these decisions without doing some type of model. Um, and, you know, what is this impact, how it's going to impact cash flows negatively, positively. So I think it's, again, a credit to you in terms of you have planned that out. Um, and, you know, even though you started uh, stage two of this investment portfolio journey um, in your 50s, it's just it's just such a good news story. Um, and so I want to make sure that uh, people feel empowered by that story, that it's not too late um, and that you should potentially be asking a professional in terms of how that looks and the strategies may be different for some people in their 50s chasing those, you know, sort of high inner city area, higher value assets um, mm-hmm. where you've got to contribute versus, you know, chasing those sort of entry level uh, first home buyer places or regional or, um, you know, sort of commutable locations. That's why to Bryce's point, everyone situation is different. Every plan that should be having is different, so you should never get any cooker cutty solutions from any salesperson who's trying to flog you a house package or an off the plan package, thinking you know they just do it. They sell you on the tax story, um, and basically it's not going to cost you anything to control this fancy asset, which does nothing. Whereas you've been able to handpick, or to your to your point, your your uh, buyer's agent has been able to handpick quality assets. Um, even so, some of them still had maintenance. We, we that happens to the best of us in terms yes. of unexpected maintenance so that should be planned for as, as part of that particular story so again I, I want to credit you my um my final question to you um is is really around what's happening in the marketplace now and and the the sort of negative um uh, connotations around investors 
and the fact that, you know, renters are doing it tough at the moment and there are definitely some renters who are doing it tough at the moment. When you look at your portfolio and when you consider a rental increase, how much of that um, do you think about when it comes to the tenant that you've got in the property as opposed to just going for the most aggressive rental increase that you can get? Yeah, it's interesting because I, I, I hear a lot about it on the media. You know, landlords are uh, being unreasonable and taking advantage of tenants and so on. I look at the increases over the past 12 months and they've been moderate, I would say. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I take guidance from the agent, but I, I've never looked to profiteer or take advantage in a tough market. Um, so I've got some tenants, uh, one in particular has been in the same house for almost three years now. And, you know, the rent increases there, I I respect them as tenants. They've been really good. They always pay on time. Maintenance is negligible. So it was a very modest increase. You know, my certainly- analysis, yeah, my, my, my preliminary analysis that I've done and... and I've obviously done it on my portfolio. My interest costs have gone up over basically a hundred thousand dollars, right? Yeah. Now, so it's roughly for those people who have got a reasonable amount of debt against their portfolio. You're talking around um, a twenty-five to maybe a thirty-five percent increase in rent, rental income that you've been able to achieve. But your your cost base has gone up enormously. So it's about so we're we're recovering around a third of the costs. That have gone up for most investors, and if that. You'll, you'll find that that those investors who have been more aggressive and have built their portfolio too quickly, and the ones who are potentially now selling out, um, that being able to only recover thirty percent was not enough to keep them in the game, and so they've had to divest of a couple of those properties. Which is again another lesson for beginners: is that property investing is a long-term game. Be patient in the way in which you approach mm-hmm. it, and don't get aggressive. Like, you know, like getting wealthy is easy. Staying wealthy is hard. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, look, I, I've taken the approach of, you know, being reasonable. I want the tenants there for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. If they stay there forever, happy days for me. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, driving the rents up too drastically, I think, is short-term thinking. Correct. In my view. My final question to you, Tom, is this. Uh, I put the call out to say, come on to the property couch. I'm always intrigued as to why someone would come and be so um, transparent mm-hmm. about what they've done and the lessons along the way. Why, why did you come on? What was it about your story that you hoped would benefit our community? Yeah, I, I don't know if it's my, well, maybe it is my story. I, I've listened to you guys for a few years and I get a lot out of what you guys talk about, whether it's with each other or with other people in various shows. The building my buffer, I learned from you guys. You know, I picked up certain things and put a strategy together to give myself that protection or us that protection. So I thought, you know, if I can pick up those sort of things from you guys, maybe some of my experiences others can pick up and benefit from, hopefully. You know, maybe they they learn a few things not to do and better still learn a few things that might help. Yeah, well said. Thank you for for that contribution. Ben hinted earlier, or probably didn't hint, he said it, we get a lot of questions from a lot of people about am I too late to start? Mm -hmm. We, We get a lot of questions around that. So you... You can be an inspiration for our community that's listening to go. Hey, all right. Well, most of the heavy lifting was done in the fifties. We uh, had a we had an experience back in the mid twenties, um, uh, but most of the heavy lifting was done in the fifties. So, um, well done. You um, thank you. It's a credit to 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 you and Crystal. And um, I'm I'm excited for all the times that you get to spend with your seven grandchildren and and um, getting the fruit lot. of. Um, everything that you've done within your portfolio. So on behalf of everyone here on the Property Couch, Tom, uh, thanks for coming on and sharing your story. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Tom. It was terrific. Thanks, guys. Oh, Ben, how, how enjoyable was that? Having someone who uh, st- 
you and I, we talked about it in the episode there or talked about it in the interview, but we get so many questions where people just say, uh, am I leaving it too late to start? Well, hopefully Tom is an inspiration that with the right uh, advice and the right moves and the action threshold being low enough, it's uh, never too late to start. Yeah, I think there's a message in there that, you know, he was clear that he got professional guidance, uh, made a connection with someone to help him in that process. And and I think that is important. I mean, one of the things when you are thinking about investing later in life is you really can't afford to make any mistakes. And so getting the sequencing right, getting the planning right, understanding the strategy and the tactics in terms of how you're going to do that is really important. So I cannot emphasize enough that if you are thinking about starting later in life, um, it's best to have a really clear runway, make the invisible visible and see how that journey plays out for you. Because when you do that, you get results like Tom got. And so Tom and Crystal, it's just just wonderful that you see these types of people, um, however the trigger was, whatever the event was, being the heart attack and so forth. Just, it's a great story. And so yeah. all credit to them, all credit to the people who have helped look after them. Um, in terms of guiding them on that story. It hasn't been smooth sailing, we heard also, um, in terms of, you know, you're always going to have maintenance issues. There's always going to be potentially challenges when you've got a, a multiple portfolio around some of the tenants that you do attract from time to time. But on the whole, the juice has been worth the squeeze. The juice has been worth the squeeze, Ben. Isn't it interesting too that um, it, it, in, in an indirect way, it promotes um, why borderless investing is so important, Ben, because... Tom was blessed to uh, grow up and live in New South Wales, which is a high population centre and property's done very, very well for him in that area. But if he actually was born in another part of the country that wasn't so blessed with property performance, would the story have been the same? Well, people who haven't been born there actually still get the same opportunities because in this country, you can go and buy into these markets that have the big metropolises and the big uh, population drivers and the big income drivers that allow you to be a part of that. So... But um, clearly, uh, New South Wales was dominant, then uh, regional New South Wales, and then went to Adelaide, and then went to Queensland, went to Perth. So that is definitely a story about getting borderless right. But if you haven't been born in those states, you can still um, take advantage of it. So, yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, you could just have this sense of calm, didn't you, Tom? It was um, yeah, even in the yeah, conversation measured. was measured and peaceful. And, um, and I mean, he also reminded me of, you know, my biggest mistake too was when I sold you know, that Bandura property. So we've we've both got that Ooh, yes. war wound where there's hundreds of thousands of dollars of lost value. And again, you know, I want to double click on that point to anyone who's thinking about selling properties, um, do whatever you can um, to try and avoid that where possible. Go back, see if there's, there's obviously new opportunities around refinancing at the moment. Um, in refinancing terms, you can do lower buffers um, so some of the lenders are out there and there's even a couple of lenders out there who are doing a little cash out piece as well. So up to $50,000 in cash out. So if you're not familiar with who that lender is, uh, connect in with your mortgage broker and, and have a bit of a yarn about that. Because to Bryce's point, um, when he was talking to his mate at dinner recently, just, just trade through this period. It's all about just buying you that time um, is my final message for today's episode. And just for uh, the avoidance of doubt, Ben, if you don't have a mortgage broker that can help you with that, just reach out to ours, just send us a note and we will connect you up and make sure that you get access to that as well. But uh, just to pour a little bit of salt on that wound that you just brought up, Ben, bought that ride property for 212000 <laughs> yeah. sold it for 550000 That's not bad. That's yep. pretty good. But if you actually stay the journey, $1.7 million. Yeah. Yeah, well, you don't go broke making a profit, but there's opportunity <laughs> costs associated with that. We've all got those stories. So, Tom, Crystal, focus on the positive. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful big portfolio there. Was it 5.54 mil? Yeah. Um, you know, a little bit of debt still in there, two mil of debt. So, yeah. you know, trade that out and you're, uh, you're on still your way. Good. So, congratulations. But, uh, folks, it's a decades game. I don't know. <laughs> if, if we, have we refined our message down to two things now, Ben? Take action and play for the decades game. Is that, is that as simple as game. the property couch gets? So, oh, very good. Tom, we appreciate you. I think everyone who listens to that will appreciate you as well. And Ben, until Absolutely. next week. Knowledge is empowering, but only if you act on it. This is very true. See you next week, folks.